Oh, well, kia ora tefano. How are we doing? It is really nice to be back here live. Um, I haven't actually been on the stage live for about three months, and I was meant to be here a few weeks ago, and then, of course, it's ankle deep in here, and none of us wanted to be here that day, and so they ended up online again, and it felt like we were back in lockdown all of a sudden, and that was depressing. So it's very nice being here and actually looking out and seeing all of you here and knowing there's a stack load of you online as well. It's awesome to have you guys with us too. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving to this building for a meeting with a friend of mine, and um, we hadn't seen each other for a few months, and so Steve asked me, um, in light of the, the cancer diagnosis that I had late last year, like, what, what are my reflections on getting cancer at 53? And so for those of you who don't know, I was diagnosed in late November with um, bowel cancer and ended up having surgery a couple of weeks later in the middle of December, and they've taken out the tumour, and... Um, and it's all clear, the lymph nodes are clear, I don't need chemotherapy, I have a clean bill of health, they'll check me regularly for the next five years, but I'm, I'm free, I'm done. You know, go live life, and yeah, thank you. Um, we're really blown away just by the mercy of God and that, and what God has done in answering so many people's prayers, it's been remarkable. So, um, yeah, so they took out half the colon, which my brother-in-law says means I'm only a semicolon now. Um, but apart from that, incredibly thankful for what God has done. And so Steve and I are driving here to a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and he said, so what have you reflected on? Like, what does that make you think about? You know, cancer's a scary word. You're only 53, you know, which is really young, by the way. Just want to say that, you know. What do you think, what have you thought through? And it was a great question, and, and we ended up talking. There were three different things that I talked to him about that have been reflections of mine. Um, but it's really the first thing that I raised with him that I want to kind of bring now and have us think on for a few minutes together. And I said, probably the, the number one reflection I had was on my mortality, on my mortality, that, that I could die. And that's the reality. When you're given a cancer diagnosis, particularly at the beginning, and they haven't opened you up yet and taken the tumor out and, and seen whether or not it's spread, they, they didn't want to tell me what stage of cancer it might be until they'd done that. And, and so you are actually staring death in the face a little bit. And I said to him, it just reminded me of something we all know in this room and online, and that is we're all going to die. You realize that, don't you? You're going to die one day, and so am I. And, and having this diagnosis brought me back face to face with that reality. Because what we do, folks, and this is virtually all of us no matter who you are, from where in the world you are, what we tend to do is we know intellectually one day I'm going to die, but we really don't think about that that much or live in light of that until we're getting close. So a few of you look like you're a little bit closer than I am, and that's okay. But you know, some of you guys in your teens or your 20s, even your 30s, it feels so far away, doesn't it? I remember when I was that age, a young adult, the idea of, you know, I knew intellectually, yeah, I'm going to die one day, but it has absolutely no impact on me. And then you get a diagnosis, Mr. Carr, you have cancer. Or you face a situation that, that friends of ours faced in January, where their beautiful 18-year-old daughter ends up lying in a hospital bed in Auckland Hospital, on life support in a coma, with meningococcal meningitis. And she'd just been at a festival and happened to share a water bottle with someone and they think that's how she caught it. And for a while it was touch and go whether death had come for that 18 year old precious young woman. And thankfully it didn't and she's recovered and she's out of hospital and miraculously there is absolutely no long term repercussions of that, which is a miracle, honestly. But it makes you stop and realize every single one of us are mortal. We are all going to die, and that is ahead of each of us in our journey. And so in light of that, I want us to stop and think on that for a little bit today, and think about, in light of that, what really counts in life? In light of our death, what really counts in life? You know, last week, JD stood up here. Uh, for those of you who are here live, or like me, were watching on online and joining in there, um, and he shared with us the vision for our church for this coming year. And he talked about the fact that, that Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is like yeast 
And, and each granule of yeast, yeast looks so insignificant, doesn't so small, and yet it carries this massive punch, this ability to, to multiply so much. And he, and he reminded us God has, has put the message of the gospel into our hands and the ability to see that multiplied individually but also as a church. And it was cool, wasn't it, hearing some of the, the dreams and the vision for this year as a church. We wanna be more of a, a connected church and an irresistible church and, and a healthy church, a multiplying church. And there were so many cool things that he outlined that we can be part of moving forward as a community. But in light of the, the vision of our church this year, I wanted to ask you today, what's your vision personally? As you look at 2023 stretching out ahead of you, what are, what are you thinking about and, and dreaming of and planning of? I don't know if you're a New Year's resolution type person and you, January 1, you had a whole list ready to go or whether that's not really you, and, but you have some goals that you'd like to see accomplished this year. Or maybe you've just got not even that well planned. You just kind of, yeah, you've got some dreams, some, some hopes of what 2023 might be. But what I want to invite us to do is to stop and think about what are our resolutions or our goals or our, just our dream for 2023, and do those things really count in light of our mortality and in light of eternity? When I was in high school and university, I actually worked in a couple of uh, clothing stores down in the Hutt Valley in Wellington. Worked for a chain store, first of all, that sold menswear, and then, a, and then a, a, an independent retailer that did men's and women's wear. And I worked in there for a number of years. And each year, there would come a day where we would close the stores early, and um, the staff would get together, and we did this fun routine together called stock take. And we had to count up every garment and every stitch of clothing in the whole store. And because I was the junior, you know, I was the, the, the high school kid initially, so junior gets sent to the back of the store, and I get to count socks, undies, hankies, and ties. That was my job, you know, all the men's socks and undies, because no, none of the senior staff want to do that. But the reason we did stock take was but we wanted to be able to give um, the, the accountant an accurate snapshot of what everything was really worth. And what I want to invite you to do today in these next few minutes is to take a stock take of your life. In light of our mortality, in light of the fact that every single one of us are going to die sooner or later, how do our dreams, how does the pattern of our lives, how does what we're, the way we're living at the moment and what we're looking forward to in this coming year, how does that measure up? In light of our death, what really counts in life? And that's where I want to come to a psalm in the book of Psalms today, Psalm 49. You can turn to it if you want, or we're going to have the verses up on the screens here as well. Over the summer, we've had a, a great series in the book of Psalms, and we were the number of our emerging preachers, um, and I had the privilege of mentoring and training them over a couple of years, and was so proud of the way these, uh, these mainly young people, young preachers, opened up the books, uh, the, the different individual Psalms for us. And today, I want to come back to a final Psalm, really, uh, Psalm 49. Psalm 49 is what uh, scholars call a wisdom psalm, which means it's very similar to like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and other parts books in the Old Testament that are really about practical wisdom for life, how to really practically live, um, live our lives well in terms of wisdom. And Psalm 49 is talking about living life in light of our death. It's a psalm about our mortality. It was written, there's a little heading at the top of it, it's written by the sons of Korah, who are some of the worship leaders uh, of, the, uh, of God's people in the Old Testament. And so they write the psalm to give us wisdom about death. And there's three key moves that they're gonna make in this, three key sections to the psalm. Listen, reflect, and understand. So there's gonna be a call to, hey, listen up to what we wanna share with you. Then there's a call to reflect on this and what it means for our lives. And then finally, they're gonna end with a call to, to understand what this means for the way we live. So first of all, in the first four verses, they, they give this call to listen. Let me just read the first two verses of that with you. They write, hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. 
So they start with this universal call. Doesn't matter what people group you're from, this is not just for the people of Israel, this is everyone. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're um, famous or whether you're just a a normal person, whether you're young or old, uh, male or female, doesn't matter what culture you're from, it doesn't matter what ethnicity, what language you speak, they're saying, hey, listen up, every single one of you, listen, lean in, because we've got something important to say in this psalm. And then what they do, they move into these two sections, two main chunks of the psalm. And the first one there is a call to reflect. So, hey, listen, this is for all of you. Now, reflect. We wanted to think about something really important. Here's how they introduce it in verses five and six. Why should I fear when evil days come? When wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches. See, in the ancient world, the vast majority of people, of course, were poor and had very little power, and they could very easily be oppressed and afflicted by those who had a lot of wealth and a lot of power. Still true, isn't it, today? And generally, that meant you were incredibly vulnerable. But what the psalmist in this psalm is saying is, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about those guys, whether they come after me or not. Well, why is that? Well, they explain it further down, verses 10 and 11. For all can see, they sing, that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. So what the sons of Korah are doing in the psalm is they're saying, hey, hey, listen, this is incredibly important for every one of us. Now, reflect on this. Death stalks all of us. We're all gonna die, is what they're saying. And Benjamin Franklin, the great American inventor, he popularized a saying of his day that has come through the centuries down to us. There are only two things certain in life. What are they? Death and taxes. He was bang on. But death's a certainty. I don't know if you realize, but recent medical studies have proven that the mortality rate's 100%. (laughs) That's the reality, isn't it? We're all going to die. And so what the sons of Korah are telling us in the psalm is, hey, we all need to lean in for a minute and reflect on that fact. We are all going to pass away, all of us, face death. And I love what they say in verse 11, by the way. Notice this. Their tombs will remain their houses forever. Their dwellings for endless generation, though they had named lands after themselves. We live out in East Auckland, very near to the Botany Town Centre. And right across the road from Botany Town Centre, there's this beautiful park. Um, This is some photos of it. It's got these walkways and pathways, this beautiful pond. It's lovely. This lovely reserve right across the road from the shopping centre and it's called Logan Car Reserve. Now that surprised us, because when we moved out to East Auckland about 20 years ago, we had two little toddlers, Harrison, who was up here earlier, who's our oldest, he was four, and then his younger brother, Logan. Logan Carr. So we move out to East Auckland and see this, this beautiful reserve and go for a walk there and stuff, and then we find out it's Logan Car Reserve, and we're like, good night. People already think our hot toddler is so awesome. They've named a whole park after him. And of course they hadn't. It was another Logan Carr. So I did some investigation. Who is this other Logan Carr? And what I discovered is he was a city councillor in that area of Monaco for uh, over two decades. He'd been instrumental when there were a lot of amalgamations. It used to be in Auckland, if you remember, little towns and boroughs everywhere. And they got merged into cities. And then, of course, we've become a super city. And and Logan Carr played a key role in our part of um, Auckland for more than two decades. Sadly, he passed away in 2019. But here's the reality. He was a servant of the people of Monaco, so much so that they named this beautiful reserve after him. But he's still dead. And with all due respect to him, he's had something, a, a piece of land named after him, but that doesn't stop death coming. And what the psalmists are trying to help us to to realize is at the end of the day, we all die. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter what you think you've achieved in life. It doesn't matter how much stuff you've accumulated or how good your bank balance is. Every one of us die. 
And we actually need to think seriously about our mortality. I love the way that these verses 10 and 11 are rendered in uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. Here's the way it reads. Anyone can see that the brightest and best die, wiped out right along with fools and idiots. They leave all their prowess behind, move into their new home, the coffin. The cemetery is their permanent address. So the sons of Korah are saying, hey, listen, lean in. This is for every single one of us and reflect on this. Death stalks all of us. We're all going to die. So how then should we live? Well, that's what they cover at the end here in the last section. So they begin this way in verses 13 to 15. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and they're destined to die. Death is gonna be their shepherd. But the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms are gonna decay in the grave far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. See, what the sons of Korah are doing here is they are contrasting two different kinds of people. Those who trust in themselves and those who trust in God. And they say those who trust in themselves are gonna face death and they can't escape it. Death, in fact, becomes their shepherd. Death hounds them and brings them into the grave where they decay. But in contrast to that, you notice what they sing. Those who trust in God, it's as though God is their shepherd, which is what other Psalms talk about. And the result of that is they will be redeemed. That word redeem means to pay a ransom or to purchase the freedom from someone. And so what they're saying is that if you trust in God, death isn't the end of the story. If you trust in God, put your faith in him. He is the one who can bring life after death. In fact, this idea of being redeemed is, is something they've already talked about earlier in the psalm. We jumped over verses seven to eight, but here's what they would sung. No one can redeem the life of another or to give God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly and no payment is ever enough. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how loaded you are, the richest dude in the world, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, I don't know who's at the top at the moment. You, no human being has enough money to purchase the freedom and life and eternal destiny of another human being or themselves. You can't be redeemed from death by anyone other than God. And so what this psalm is saying is we need to reflect seriously about death and understand if we go through life simply trusting in ourselves, we are toast, no matter who we are. But if we trust in God, we have an answer to our mortality and our death. Listen, they say, lean in, understand this. Reflect, death stalks all of us, we're all gonna die. But understand this, there is a promise of life for those who trust in God. See, the key idea of this psalm is this. Live a life that counts in light of the countdown. Live a life that counts in light of the countdown. What do I mean by the countdown? What I mean is that every single one of us are gonna die. There's like a clock that's counting down how long we've got. And we don't know how long that is. I've been given a clean bill of health from the doctors. They'll check up on me over these coming five years, but I could, Lord willing, I'm hoping, oh, another, give me another 40 years on this planet. But I have no guarantee of that. And whether it's 40 years or 14 years or four years, or who knows, what if it's only four months? There's a countdown on my life, and I don't know how long I've got, but it's there nonetheless, and the same is true of you. We have this kind of story in our family, on, in Rochelle's side of the family, uh, that comes from her childhood. She was in early high school. Her younger brother, Mark, was at intermediate, and one school day, he came out to the kitchen, and he was feeling kind of crook, you know, feeling a bit sick, and didn't want to go to school. And you know when you're a kid, and you feel a little bit sick, and you really talk it up a bit more, oh, I don't feel too good, you know? And he did that, and he comes into the kitchen, and Rochelle's mum, Elaine, she was here first service, by the way. She is awesome. She is the most lovely mother-in-law you could expect. She's a lovely person. But she turns around that day, 
quick as a whip, when, when Mark comes in and does his moaning, he sh- says these words, we're all slowly dying. <laughs> we're all slowly dying. And do you know what? That, that, that saying has become famous in our family. Rochelle and I have pulled it out endless times, laughing with our kids, with each other. We're all slowly dying. But you know what? That is profound theology. That's exactly what Psalm 49 is wanting us to understand. We are all slowly dying. Every single one of us has a countdown on our lives. Now, you don't realize that those of you who are here live um, at Green Lane Central, you don't realize it, but as you come here Sunday by Sunday, you don't know, but there's a countdown behind you. There's a screen. You can turn around and have a look if you want. There's a screen on the back wall. And every time I get up to preach here, those evil people at the back on the tech desk, now they're going to turn the camera off on me in a minute, they start a countdown on how long I've got. And it's actually a blessing for you to make sure I don't keep you here till four in the afternoon. There's a countdown going on behind you that you have no idea is there Sunday by Sunday. And it's the same of life and death. Every single one of us have a countdown ticking away behind us and we have no clue how long we've got left. I've got eight minutes 40, by the way, if you're worried. But in life, we don't know how long we've got left on that countdown. And we will never be told. But what the psalmists, the sons of Korah, are telling us in this psalm is that we should, if we're wise, we will live a life that counts in light of that countdown. And we will make sure our life counts for something. So what does that look like? What does it look like to live a life that counts in light of the countdown? Let me suggest two simple things as we finish today. Number one, it means you trust in God. It means you trust in the only one who can purchase your life and ransom you from your impending death. That's why Jesus came to this world. God in human flesh And there's a beautiful story in John chapter 11 in the New Testament where Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. And Jesus, a few days later, goes to that village and he's gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. It's a stunning miracle in the story. But he's on his way to the village and one of the two sisters of Lazarus comes out to meet him, Martha. The other one, Mary, will come too. But he's in this conversation with Martha and Jesus says these incredibly profound words. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never ultimately die. Do you believe this? That's the words of Jesus. Now, if I stood up here and said, I'm the resurrection and the life, you'd laugh at me. But this is what Jesus said. You just saw the words on the screen. Now, either Jesus really says that and he really is the God who can redeem our lives from death or he was a complete fruitcake and you can write him off. I've been reading a wonderful theologian lately by the name of Rebecca McLaughlin. Here's what she writes in a book I'm reading at the moment. This is one of those moments in the gospel, she says, where the idea that Jesus is just a good teacher gets smashed to the ground like a piece of cheap pottery. Good teachers do not claim to be the resurrection and the life, the source of life. But that's what Jesus claims. And in this moment with Martha, Jesus claims that faith in him can conquer death itself. That's why Jesus came. That's why God stepped into our world, to live the perfect life we couldn't live to die on the cross and take the penalty and punishment for our sins and wrongdoing, to rise again from the dead and conquer death once for all. And what Jesus said is, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And if we want our lives to count in light of this countdown, one of the key ways to do that is to choose to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that before, sitting here watching online, You can do that in the quietness of your own heart right now. Simply say, I'm gonna choose to trust Jesus as my redeemer, my savior, the one who purchases my life. And if you wanna make that decision or you wanna talk more about it and you're online, just connect with one of our online hosts. They would love to talk with you, to pray with you. If you're here uh, live today, at the end of our service, we'll have a prayer team available over, over here. You can just chat to them about what it means to trust in Jesus. They would love to talk with you and pray with you. Or I'm gonna be sitting down here and I'm really not that scary. And if you wanna come and chat with me, I'd love the opportunity to do that. 
What does it mean to live a life that counts in light of the countdown? It means we trust in Jesus, we trust in God. But secondly, it means we live for him. It means we live for God in light of this countdown. And that's where the sons of Korah go at the end of Psalm 49. They call us to realize that life is not about getting loaded with money. Life's not about living for our own pleasure. Life is not ultimately about accumulating stuff or seizing power or doing any of that stuff. It's actually about living for God and living in relationship with him. Here's the way they finish the psalm, and I love the way, again, the message renders this. They write, don't be impressed by those who get rich and pile up fame and fortune. They can't take it with them. Fame and fortune all get left behind. Just when they think they've arrived and folks praise them because they've made good, they enter the family burial plot where they never see sunshine again. Jesus said something very similar. In fact, Jesus tells uh, one of his famous parables or stories uh, during his ministry. We, We know it as the parable of the rich fool. It's about this incredibly wealthy businessman who decides to take a pretty serious punt on his business. He has these big barns and he chooses to tear all of these barns down and reinvest that money and build even bigger ones. He decides there's an opportunity to be made here. There's a moment to be seized. And so he takes this enormous financial risk and it pays off brilliantly. It's like the dude has just hit the jackpot and he becomes incredibly wealthy in the way that Jesus tells the story. And he throws this party for all his family and friends to celebrate his good fortune. He is now utterly loaded, a huge success. And then Jesus ends the story with these sobering words. But God said to him, the rich man, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. You're gonna die tonight. And who's gonna get what you've prepared for yourself? It's almost like Jesus is telling that parable in light of Psalm 49. Listen to the words again from the psalm. Fame and fortune all get left behind. Just when they think they've arrived, they enter the family burial plot never to see sunshine again. You fool, Jesus says. See, a fool doesn't mean someone stupid or doesn't have any intelligence. A fool in the Bible is someone who doesn't make their life count in light of the countdown. And that's the challenge of Psalm 49 to you and me today. Listen, this is for all of us, folks. We all need to to listen into this wisdom. Reflect. Death stalks all of us. We're all gonna die. So understand that and live in light of this countdown that's on your life and mine. Let's make our lives count in light of the countdown. So as we finish, I wanna come back to the vision that JD outlined for us last week as a church all of this exciting stuff that that we're wanting to do as a church. And what I want to invite you to do is to evaluate and take stock take of your vision and your goals and your dreams for this year. And I want to ask you, is, is it possible to align some of what we want to do as a church with what you personally are looking to do? doesn't mean that all your goals have got to revolve around church. I don't personally think all of your goals need to even be spiritual per se. It's okay to, to be working on your fitness this year or aiming to finish up your degree or, or hoping to maybe even restart some study in your middle years or whatever it is. You know, if you had a goal this year to bench press more at the gym, good for you. But in, in the midst of all that, are there goals around living in light of eternity? Have you got some aims of, of things you wanna do and can you tie into this vision that we have as a church moving forward? Can you choose to give your life for some of the things that JD outlined as we walk together as a church community? You know, Thea Lissa and Harrison remind us, there's a meeting here tonight at 7 p.m. We wanna relaunch Night Church. I'm so excited about that. I think that's a core part of our vision, but we need a core group of 75 people who are willing to put their hands up and say, I wanna make Night Church work. Is that something that you can make your life count by being part of? Or can you make your life count by devoting yourself in prayer for some of the things that we wanna do as a church? We wanna launch three new Grace City at My Place locations this year. We wanna get Alpha going out at our East Campus. Is that some stuff you can invest in prayerfully and be praying for? 
as part of making your life count? Are you able to commit to the, the, the kids' holiday programs we want to launch later in the year? Or as a way for you making your life count to actually just connect into a healthy small group or a ministry team and, and start serving somewhere in the church? Does making your life count mean you want to sit down and reevaluate your financial giving to the church? Go, you know what, we haven't changed that for a few years, but we want to invest more financially into making this vision a reality in our church. I simply want to challenge us today to take a stock take. We're all mortal. We're all going to die. Listen, reflect, understand that. That's what the sons of Korah are calling out to us through the ages. Let's live lives that count in light of this countdown we all have. Lord Jesus, thank you that you made your life count. You lived knowing that your death was coming and that death was part of what it would take to redeem all of us. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us to not just live knowing we're gonna die someday, but to live in light of the countdown, to take our mortality seriously and eternity seriously and make our lives count like never before. Thank you for this vision that we have as a church that JD outlined last week. Help us to figure out how we can live into that and be part of that this coming year, we pray. Holy Spirit, would you help us to really take stock take of our lives? Bring things to mind or ideas that we need to implement, steps we can take so that we live lives that count in light of the countdown, we pray. In your name, amen.